believers are blessed in Christ with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. That's how Paul begins this letter to the Ephesians. The first main section of this letter in the original language is a single run-on sentence, a litany of praise for all of the ways God has heaped benefits on those who have been united with his son. And Paul says all of this, everything that we have been given in Christ, is part of a predetermined plan, a purpose that had been determined before the world was made. Paul is writing in this letter to build the confidence of believers. That's his objective. They'd already heard the word of truth, the gospel, and they'd believed it. Now he wants them to see more. He prays for them that they will be able to see the greatness of salvation. In the gospel... The mystery of God's purpose has been revealed. His plan is to show the heavenly powers the greatness of his wisdom, and he will do this through the church or those who are being saved. Furthermore, the church is being prepared even now as an eternal dwelling of God. So Paul again prays, that the believers will be able to even now be filled with all the fullness of God, an incredible statement, and able to comprehend God's expansive, loving, gracious plan for his people in Christ. Paul wants you to know, he wants us to know, how blessed we really are and what the grace of God has done for us and is now doing in us. It is wrong for believers to remain ignorant or small-minded about salvation or to fail to appropriate everything grace has brought to us. We needed grace to be saved, but we also require grace to understand what happened when we were saved. Grace has made us acceptable and useful to God. And that is the point where our text in Ephesians chapter 2 begins. Grace has made us acceptable and useful to God. And that is not what you were before. Outside of Christ, apart from the grace of God, we were not acceptable to God in any sense. We were not useful to God in any sense. In order to help us understand grace... And what grace has made us in Christ, Paul takes us back in time to our former life in sin apart from grace. Formerly, he says, we were dead in sins. Now, this is not a popular view of humanity. This is something that will shatter your self-esteem, which needs to be shattered. Spiritual death involves both insensitivity and alienation or separation from God. Being spiritually dead means you do not and cannot respond to God, just as a dead body does not respond to stimuli. So if, if there's a dead body there and you poke a dead body, it, it, it doesn't respond. It can't respond as it should. That's death. That's a state of death. Is, is no, no responsiveness. Now, this this is important if we want to understand what grace has done for us. If not for God's grace, we would still be dead because a dead person cannot help himself. People dead in sin do not think about God. They do not obey God. They do not talk to God. They do not care about the glory of God. As far as they are concerned, for all practical purposes, there is no God. Death also causes alienation or separation from God. There is a huge gulf, a huge separation, a tremendous gap between God and those who are dead in sin. And I'm not speaking of a spatial separation. I'm speaking of a relational separation. 
Death is also corruption. Death is offensive. Just as you are repulsed by the sight of a decaying corpse, a holy God is offended by sin. Again, something hard for modern people to, to accept. People who are dead in sins can simply cannot, in any sense, ever be pleasing to God as long as they're in that state. What Paul is saying here is that sin was once our native environment. Just like a fish is at home in the water, at one point we were living in sin. And that environment, Paul says, was a place of spiritual death. If that's not enough to describe our former state, there's more. He also says we were following the course of this world. The world Paul is talking about is that spiritual system of organized rebellion against God, which is recognized by these qualities, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We were caught up in those things, he said. Those things dominated our lives and everything that we did. We were caught up in this current, this strong, swift current of the world. We were being swept downstream by its force, swept away from God, even though we were unaware of this force. The world is not neutral, you see. The world is, is, is moving, if you will, and its movement is away from God, not towards God. Furthermore, he says, we were following the devil. Here in Ephesians 2, called the prince of the power of the air. <coughs> Everyone is subject to spiritual influences in the world. And many of these spiritual influences are evil. That is, they are opposed to God and will lead a person away from God. Satan influences people who only live according to their earthly carnal appetites. If you are completely dominated by your desires, your earthly, carnal, natural desires, that is where Satan operates. That is where Satan exerts influence on people. That is his domain, the desires of the flesh. So to sum it up, we were destined for wrath. That is God's righteous anger against all unrighteousness. Now, it has seemed to some people today that Paul is exaggerating our former condition. After all, you know, Paul's a preacher, and preachers tend to exaggerate things to, for effect. Some have said this about Paul. Because, you see, people who are dead often seem to be nice, cultured people. They don't seem to be dead. They seem to be very much alive. And they are alive to many things, but not to God. We are biologically alive in the world. Excuse me, we were biologically alive in the world, but spiritually we were dead. People in this condition are alive to many things in the world, like money or pleasure or fame or power or success, but they, were, they are not and we were not alive unto God. You could probably remember a time when, when these worldly pursuits meant more to you than your connection to God. And many of these worldly pursuits are not inherently evil, but they become evil if God is never in your thoughts. When people are in a state of spiritual death, it's easy for them to be swept along by the current of this present evil world. And we were not aware of this. We just thought we were doing what we wanted to do. But that was an illusion. People in the world are swept along by trends, fads, fashion, and popular ideologies, we sometimes call it being a slave to fashion, or just wanting to fit in, or wanting to be hip, wanting to be cool, wanting to be trendy. Young people especially just want to be accepted by their peers. No one wants to be an outsider. And this may seem like a very innocent thing, especially when we see it in young people, this desire to fit in, to please the group, to be accepted. This seems, especially in young people, a rather innocent thing, but I, I'd like to say it is not innocent at all. In the, in the effort to try to fit in, 
People have done the most horrendous things just to be accepted and fit into a group and have the approval of the world. And so people are thoughtlessly swept along by the strong current of the world, which is actually Satan's domain. He is in control, but of course, he lets them think that they are free. That's the deception. Jesus said, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. And this is, there is such a subtle deception here. We think we are free free to do what we want to do, but therein is the greatest slavery of all, the slavery to ourselves and to our own selfish desires. Perhaps you remember a time when you lived in a very small world, a world dominated only by thinking day to day about what you wanted and how you could get what you wanted and Maybe you remember that nothing made you angrier than when something or someone got in the way of you being able to be happy. That is, being able to get what you wanted. Sounds like a kind of an innocent thing, but it it isn't innocent at all. Paul says there's only one possible destiny for people who live like this. God has already passed judgment on Adam's race. And one day he will also destroy the world, the world that so many have come to love instead of the one who made the world and everything in it. And of course, you you see that Satan keeps people blissfully unaware of their true condition and destiny. He is the father of lies. Now the problem with our former condition outside of Christ was not just the things that we did. It went deeper than that. The problem was what we were, not just what we did. People who are dead in sin can do all kinds of things, many of which appear to be nice or moral or religious. The trouble is that none of those things, even the good things, are done unto God. The living God simply cannot accept dead people. We had to be made alive. And that is exactly what grace has made us in Christ, alive unto God. There is a new sensitivity to God, a new awareness of God. And what we want is no longer the primary consideration because we are alive unto God. God can work with people who are alive spiritually. In fact, the only people who can serve God effectively are those who have been given spiritual life and recreated in Christ Jesus. When we begin to think of being saved or the Christian life in these terms, in terms of actually being made spiritually alive, then we begin to understand that Christianity is more than just morality. It's more than just being nice people. If being spiritually alive is the real issue, then the mere practice of religion is not enough because spiritually dead people can still go to church on Sundays. Even signing off on all the right doctrines, belonging to the right church or religious movement comes far short of being made alive. All of the very best efforts of the flesh are obnoxious to God. In this state. It's just like trying to put lipstick on a corpse. A lot of religious activity today is not done unto God. It is done for other people to see. Spiritually dead people are more concerned about what other people think about them than what God thinks about them. If we are honest, we can all remember a time when this is how we lived. We were dead to God, insensitive to his will, and thinking only about our own agenda. Even when we did something good, it was for other people to see, not for the glory of God. We may have even gone to church and on the outside carefully whitewashed our tomb, which inside was full of death and decay. In this state, we were offensive to God and unable to please him. But Paul says, but now... But now the grace of God has made us alive, has made us a new creature in Christ. So you see, there was a great turning point in our experience, a divine turning point. But 
God. Amen. We were dead, but now, but God has made us alive in Christ. And there's only one person that could have done this. Only God can raise the dead. Amen. You cannot raise yourself from death. God had to intervene. So here we learn something about the nature of grace. Grace is God's intervention in the natural course of things. An intervention which always brings supernatural results. We must begin to see grace as a powerful force that gets things done. Grace is the ultimate power in the universe, the grace of God. Grace is active. It works. Grace does something and always accomplishes God's purpose. Amen. What many people today call grace, what they actually are talking about is the mercy of God. Yeah, right. People will often refer to their, their past or, or to their, even their present sins, and they'll say, well, thank God for his grace. But what they're really referring to is the mercy of God. God may have mercy on us, not treating us as our sins deserve, but grace goes farther than this. Not simply, grace doesn't simply withhold wrath and judgment from us. Grace bestows God's good, good gifts upon us. Amen. You remember when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers in Egypt, yeah. he sent them back to get his elderly father, Jacob. And this was during a time of famine. Not only was Jacob's family at that point being saved from the famine, they were also getting a first-class ticket to the best of the land of Egypt under Joseph's rule and care. And so the Bible says, When old Jacob saw the wagons that Joseph had sent for him and his family to go to Egypt, his spirit was revived. <laughs> that is grace. Now this same grace that gave us life has also made us a part of God's eternal purpose in Christ. Before this, you see, we were being swept downstream in the current of the world. Now we're right in the middle of the current of God's eternal purpose. The eternal purpose of God is running throughout this context in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Everything that has happened to us is really part of a divine plan formulated before the foundation of the world. Now, I know this kind of thing sounds less than desirable to modern ears because we believe in our ability to make our own choices and chart our own course. But Paul has already proven, already told us that this kind of self-determination or free will is really an illusion. We were not in control of our lives. How can you be in control if you're dead? In the same way, our rescue from our previous state was not something we could bring about ourselves. It had to be done by grace. What has happened to us in Christ was not our own doing, but was part of God's plan. And if you and I can somehow escape from the presuppositions of our age, this truth of predestination can be a great source of joy and confidence to the believer in Christ. Amen. Paul is not saying that we are made into mindless drones or that God ruthlessly condemns people to hell who desperately want heaven. What Paul is saying is that God is the one who is responsible for you being in Christ and not you yourself, which means it was all of grace. In other words, God has made it possible for us to be saved because if there was no plan of salvation, there would be no salvation. No matter how much we wanted it or searched for it, all would be lost. But God has opened the door. We were once outsiders, but we are now insiders, made privy to the secret of the universe, a mystery that was once hidden but is now revealed in the gospel. We were destined for eternal ruin and uselessness, but now we are on a new journey, one with a divinely appointed destination and purpose in Christ. 
And the only way we could have gone from being outsiders to now being insiders is if God himself chose to open the door and let us in on his secret. No philosophy, no amount of scientific experimentation could have discovered the eternal purpose of God. If we know the truth, it is by grace. We know God's plan through revelation. The gospel is really the revelation of God's eternal purpose and our introduction or induction into it, and that is all by grace alone. Now, it seems that it was the Apostle Paul who had the most insight into this eternal purpose of God, even more than the other apostles of Christ. When the time was right, God let his secret out through Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. In fact, part of this mystery was that Gentiles could get in on God's plan, something that previously would have been thought to be impossible. And so here is God once again doing something new, something surprising. The grace of God is big enough to reach out and include Gentiles in the plan of the ages. The choice of God was clear, and it is never a good idea to object to God's choice. God had chosen even the Gentiles by grace, and no one has the right to veto God's grace. God's choice is the thing that makes grace what it is. Grace is God choosing to do what he wants to do, and we can either get in on it and get the blessing or get out of the way. God has revealed what he intends to do, and that purpose will stand and will not change. The purpose has been prepared over many centuries with small-scale information leaks periodically. But how blessed we are to live in these times. It is an eternal purpose, prepared outside of time, and continuing even when time shall be no more and the heavens and earth pass away. Now, even in the light of the gospel, we do not yet see the fullness of God's purpose. Only in the coming ages, while the ceaseless cycles of eternity roll on, will God unfold the riches of his grace. We have only touched the hem of the garment on this side of eternity, locked within the confines of time and the limitations of our flesh. You see, God is preparing us. Grace is preparing us for eternity where the real story will begin, of which we have only read the first chapter here. Now, because we are part of an eternal purpose, we must be people with an eternal perspective. Our minds are not dominated, cannot be dominated by what is temporal. At this point, many Christians will be afraid of being overly spiritual or being too heavenly minded so as to be of no earthly good. I'm sure you've heard that before. But I agree with C.S. Lewis who said, whatever is not eternal is eternally out of date. Nothing is more relevant than eternity. If our main preoccupation is the purpose of God, it is not because we are checking out of life in this world, neglecting our stewardship and our responsibilities, but because we know that ultimately no other agenda will succeed except for the purpose of God. Why be part of a losing team? Why invest in a bankrupt company? Why buy a ticket for a cruise on the Titanic? Paul does not mean to make us into a bunch of starry-eyed mystics gazing up at the heavens while life passes us by. He means to build our confidence in our calling and salvation, which are even more reliable than the heavens and the earth. These things will pass away, but God's purpose will not. By this time and because of the age in which we live, we should all know about the instability of the world. Whatever can be shaken will be shaken. Our brother Henry F. Light wrote in his beautiful hymn, one of my personal favorites, the hymn Abide With Me. He wrote about the world in which we live. Swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. 
Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away, change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. And so what we call sanctification, which also happens by grace, is really the process of eliminating everything from our affection that competes with the eternal purpose of God. God's people have been taught to think of our life in the world as a journey, a pilgrimage, or a voyage to glory. And there's some baggage we can't take on this journey. Any good journey has a destination that is predetermined. Otherwise, we would never know where we are going. Perhaps you heard about the man who stopped a stranger to ask for directions. And the stranger asked the man who was asking for directions, where are you going? And the man, looking very confused, replied, well, I'm not really sure. And so the stranger replied, then the road you are on is just fine. Every journey has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the same is true for salvation. The beginning is really what most people call salvation. But as long as we continue to sojourn in these mortal coils, our salvation is technically a work in progress. By grace, we must remember where we have come and what we are in Christ. Grace has united us with the resurrected Christ. Now the apostle is reminding us of these things so that we will not lose ground, but will instead move forward toward the heavenly goal. In other words, you are not what you were, so you can't go on living like you did. Paul says that believers are in Christ, united with him, identified with him. And this is more than just a metaphor. It is describing a spiritual reality. This is not a goal that we should be united with Christ. It is a description of what it means to be saved by grace. By grace, God Put us in Christ. And the implications of this are staggering to consider, and we should consider them often. We are in Christ. By contrast, we were in Adam. We were identified with Adam and his race, which is under God's condemnation. But now we have been united with Christ, and everything that is true for Christ has been transferred to us. Just as Christ was raised, we have also been raised. Just as Christ has been exalted into the heavenly realms, we are also seated there with him. Now that may sound strange because our bodies are still on the earth, but you see the work isn't done yet. The goal is to bring everything in heaven and everything on earth together in Christ. The first stage is accomplished by God putting us in Christ. In order to understand the final destination of God's purpose, we must first understand where we are now, saved by grace, having been made one with Christ. Our connection with Christ is not like the connection we might have with a great hero of the past whom we admire and want to imitate. When we are connected to Jesus, we are being connected to a living person. The fact that Christ is in heaven does not limit our connection to him at all. In fact, his presence in heaven is the thing that makes all of this possible. That is why Jesus told his disciples, it is for your good that I am going away. Christ can do much more for us in heaven than he could while on the earth, being limited by space and time. If God's ultimate plan is to bring heaven and earth together, then it is logical that the Redeemer himself needed to first descend to the earth and then ascend into heaven, which is exactly what Christ has done. And he will descend again when the plan of God reaches its fulfillment. In the meantime, those who are in Christ, united with him, are spiritually already seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Physically, we're on the earth. Spiritually, we're already in heaven reigning with Christ. And this is a prelude 
of things to come. But even now, being seated with Christ in heavenly places, we have access to God through him. Being seated with Christ in heavenly places, we are aware of a higher reality, no longer living with our heads nailed to the earth. Now, if all this begins to sound too high-minded or mystical, we need to go back to when we were first united with Christ, which was at our baptism. Remember that everything that is true of Christ is true for those in Christ. When we were baptized, we died with Christ and were raised with him. The Lord gave us this visible way of remembering something that is invisible because this becomes an anchoring point for our faith. I'm talking about baptism. We are to reason upon what happened when we were baptized into Christ. A man puts you under the water, but God puts you in Christ, uniting us with him and all the saving effects of his death, resurrection life, and ascension into the heavens. Where he is, there we will be also. Now, grace gives us this ability to see, to perceive this invisible union with Christ and to begin to appropriate its power. There are things that we must appropriate or learn or become acutely sensitive to and aware of, things that are not apparent to the senses. If this appropriation does not happen, we will not grow up in Christ, which actually is the goal of our salvation. What I'm trying to communicate, what Paul is trying to communicate here in Ephesians 2, is that grace gives us much more than just forgiveness of sins. We also are sharing in the very life of Jesus, having been united with him. Ultimately, the purpose of God is for us to be conformed to the image of his son. And Romans 8, 28 through 30 is probably the most succinct statement of God's eternal purpose. And I I think I will take the time to read it. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. As we have already discussed today, we should be intimately familiar with what God is doing. That's what is meant by eternal purpose. God is creating a new race of men who are like his son, Jesus Christ. He, Jesus, is the firstborn among many brethren. Adam represents the old race. Jesus represents the new And we belong to one race or the other, each with radically different destinies. The destiny of those in Christ is glorification, which is the final stage of salvation. But this process of change leading to glorification begins here in this world. And so I want to end with a very practical question. How does this happen? How does this transformation into the image of Christ How does this begin to happen in us? Well, without being irreverent, the Lord gives us what sometimes seem like terribly mundane ways to make this transformation begin. For example, you start out with the very humbling act of being submerged in water. Soon after this, we are regularly ingesting very small portions of bread and wine. We read the scriptures. We pray. We meet with other believers who are also called to do these things, and together we learn to care about each other. He may even ask you to start giving money. And some people will say, 
what are we back in Sunday school again? You, you, you mean the, the way to do this, to, the way to begin this incredible journey to glory is to, just like they told you in Sunday school, read the Bible, pray, and go to church? Remember, that was the answer to everything in Sunday school when you were a kid. It sounds kind of simple, but, but notice that in all of those acts, there is some kind of small self-denial that has to happen in you. And as we continue to deny ourselves each day, more grace is given, and with grace, a little more of the life of Jesus. Remember Naaman the Syrian, who was desperate for a cure for his leprosy? He was told to simply go and dip seven times in the Jordan, and he would be healed. And at first, he refused to do that very simple but also kind of humiliating act. But when he humbled himself and obeyed the word of the Lord, he obtained grace and he was healed. In the same way, the Lord sometimes asks us to do unexpected and perhaps even unexciting things. But in our response of self-denial, we are given grace and eternal life. So in his letter to the Ephesians, the apostle wants believers to be able to comprehend the greatness of salvation so we will continue to grow in this grace. The grace of God has raised us from death. Grace can also empower us to be filled with the very resurrection life of Jesus. Spiritually, by grace, we're already seated in the heavenly places with Christ, but physically, we're still in the lower earthly regions. And because of that, we still need the power of grace until the work is finished and all of God's children are safely home. Amen. 